Hello friends, I'm Haley, and today I will be discussing the Shanama of Shah Tamasp, or as it is sometimes referred to, the Hoyton Shanama. Oh, there we go. And the Shanama, or the Book of Kings, is Iran's national epic poem. It details the history of kingship in Persia, or as I just said, present-day Iran. It chronicles the human experiences of love, death, and suffering, and the stories of the kings and heroes who predate the introduction of Islam to Persia. So essentially, the epic covers the ancient history of all the Iranian kings from the creation of the world all the way until the Arab conquest of the 7th century. And the epic was first written by Abu al-Qasim Firdasi in 1000 to around 110 AD. And what's especially interesting is that of the several hundred known illustrated manuscripts of the epic, all of these post-date the creation of the text by around 300 years. So the text was made around the 1000s, and the first known copy of the illustration appears around the 1300s. And of course, one huge question is, why is this? And one hypothesis is that the illustrations appeared in tandem with the establishment of Mongol rule. And this was a way that the Mongols um, kind of ironized themselves. It was part of their process of ironization, so to speak. They were looking to integrate their dynasty with the heroic myths and traditions of ancient Iran. And um, here I've shown you the great one page of the Great Mongol Shamana, which was one of the first illustrated Shamana, Shanamas, which appeared in the 1300s. But we're going to focus on the Shanama of Shah Tamasp, which began to get worked on around 1524 and took around several decades to make. Um, it was created under the reign of the Safavid Empire, and it was completed under Shah Tamasp, which was the second Shah of the Safavid dynasty. Um, patronage of the version actually began under Shah Ismail I, who is the father of Shah Tamasp, and it was completed in the northern Persian city of Tabriz, which was once the capital of the Safavid Empire. <coughs> It's a very long, detailed, complex work, and it was employing a whole workshop of people, paper makers, calligraphers, painters, illuminators, binders, other craftsmen, um, some of the renowned artists of the times who successfully, success, successively, I'm so sorry, worked as directors of the project were Sultan Muhammad, Mir Musavir, and Aqua Mirak, but I really wouldn't worry too much about noting names as there were likely hundreds of hands working on the piece, and these were just some of the quote-unquote major players, we could say. <coughs> the Shanama of Shah Tamas contains 759 folios, or pages, and it is made out of a fine paper enriched with large gold embellished borders, and it is written in Nastalik script. And it marks the synthesis of two very important styles in the Persian tradition, which is the Turkmen style from the region of Tabriz. And this is where we get this sort of lively treatment and bright colored landscapes and surfaces. And then we have the Shiraz in Timurid style, which is associated with the region of Harad. And um, that's where we get the influence of this kind of balanced compositional layout. <coughs> So the Safavid dynasty is considered to be a foundational dynasty to the Islamic public of Iran. Safavid itself translates to purity of their religion, and starting in 1501, for over a 200-year span, the Safavids controlled really large parts of what is today Iran and Azerban. Manuscript illumination was central to the royal Safavid patronage of the arts, and this is probably partially because Tamas himself for a while also studied painting in Harat. And as we say, works of art have lives, works of arts have lives, so we're going to take a look at some historical context surrounding the work and also its provenance, so where it's been since its creation. <coughs> and we're going to start by noting the context of the Islamic world in the 16th century, which was highlighted by a very intense holy war going on between the Sunni Ottomans and the Shiite Safavid empires. And this, um, this conflict went on for around 40 years until around 1555 when the Ottomans and Safavids concluded this war and decided to sign the Treaty of Amaisa. So once the Shanama was completed, it was celebrated and admired in the royal court for only about several years. And then Shah Tamas, the once lover of painting, grew really tired of painting and he disbanded his entire entire royal workshop. And this is kind of where the Ottomans come back in, is that Shah Tamas actually gifts the Shanama to Ottoman Sultan Selim II to mark his succession. So this is the son of Sultan Selim I, who signed the treaty with um, Shah Tamas. And from there, the, Sh the Shanama of Tamas was held in the Ottomans Royal Library until around the 20th century. And then 
point and happens to it, I guess we could say, according to my title. Um, the next question, I guess, is where does it go after that? Um, so impoverished courtiers are reported to have stolen manuscripts from the Royal Library in the early 20th century, and they sold them to European American art dealers. And this was during a time that the Western fascination with Oriental and Eastern illustrations was really on the rise in the growing art market. By 1903, the Shahnameh was moved to Paris and it entered the collection of a man named Baron Edmund de Rothschild. And then two years after Rothschild's son's death in 1957, the manuscript in its entirety is sold to the American magnate collector and bibliophile Arthur A. Hoyton Jr. And this is where things kind of get ugly. <laughs> Um, Hoyton commissions for a luxurious monograph reproduction of all 258 of the pages of illustration, but to make the plates for this publication, the manuscript apparently had to be completely unbound, and it was never put back together again. <clears throat> In 1962, Hoyton puts a small group of the paintings now framed in silk mats in exhibits in the Bibliophilic Groiler Club in New York, which he was president of at the time. And these exhibitions were most definitely strategic. They were happening at a time when Middle Eastern, especially Persian works, were in very high demand and the international art market was continuing to heat up. And in 1970, when the Met celebrated its centennial, Hoyton, who was chairman of the board at the time, donated 76 of the pages to their collection. And this was all in the midst of Hoyton finalizing his third divorce and his fourth marriage when he started off started auctioning off books and other manuscripts. And by 1976, individual folios or pages of the Shahnameh of Shah Tamas began appearing on sale in the market. Um, the most famous of all of the folios, the Court of Gamers, was actually acquired by Prince Sadurin of Aga Khan, and it still remains in the Aga Khan Museum today, and we'll touch a little bit more on it later. <coughs> Following the Iranian Revolution of 1979, the art market changed and talk of further dismembering the manuscript was increasing. And then following Hoyton's death in 1990, his son decided to sell what was left of the very sad carcass of the manuscript, including its remaining 118 pages and its binding. And in 1994, nego negotiations between a London dealer and the Museum of the Contemporary Arts in Tehran led for the rest of the manuscript to finally be delivered back to its home country. The museum traded a 1953 William de Kooning painting titled Woman the Third that Empress Farah had purchased, and this was deemed distasteful by the Islamic Republic. Um, the trade-off commenced in the Vienna airport, and here's a picture of the de Kooning it was traded for. So now we're finally going to get to take a look inside the work for the time we have left. And um, this is the Court of Gamers, also called the Court of Gamers, however you want to spell it. Um, and it still resides, as I said, at the Aga Khan Museum. It is like, ironic to note after this really tragic story, but it is also important to mention that any miniature from an illuminated work should not be thought of in isolation, but that we should rather be mindful of this relationship between the text and images. And that being said, <coughs> The Court of Gamers is attributed to Sultan Muhammad for the most part, um, who I mentioned before. We can note the Turkmen school style with the bright treatment of the figures and the surfaces, the rectangular form of the composition, which we get from the school of Herat, its complex mastery of colors, minute details, emotional intensity. We see the Arcadian world, which is a world in which animals and humans live in harmony with one another, and this reflects a very popular motif in Persian painting of spirituality and connection to nature through plant, man, animal, and mineral. And Gayumers is the ruler who is seated in the middle. He has just been warned by Angel Suresh about the plot of Yeruman, and this is a plot that his son is the fatal target of, and he gestures kind of tense and sharply towards his son. Um, and this triangle previously mentioned again is created to illustrate an eternal battle between good and evil. Um, I would love to tell you guys some more about some other really important pages in the work, but it looks like we're just about out of time. And I thank you all for listening. <laughs>